and so I've been uh, preaching through it and t- taking studies on it. Uh, we know that James loves an illustration. And here we have verse 3 of chapter 3. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. And I can imagine James sort of sitting there as he's writing the letter down, thinking, looking around and trying to figure out these, something that he sees in everyday life that has a small input, but a big output. Perhaps if he was living in 21st century Britain, he would, might use an aeroplane, I don't know, a big A380. I'm a, I'm a bit of a plane nerd, and if you've ever seen an A380, it's a Boeing aircraft, double-decker, huge thing, and it's astounding how this thing takes off with all its engines, its four engines, and the, all the people and the, everything else. So I know the laws, basically, of aerodynamics, and I still don't understand it. But I'm told by those who fly these things, or YouTube clips or whatever, that one small a pull of the yoke or the joystick, this thing can gracefully turn. What, what about if James was writing this letter now and another thing? What about this? A mobile phone. So small, isn't it? Slips, slips into your pocket. Not, not, perhaps not like Tom's, the uh, brick thing he's got on there. <laughs> Getting a new one, I know. A small thing, but can do massive damage. Many a celebrity, I've been reading some biographies of footballers recently, many celebrities have been caught, perhaps in compromising ways. Their pictures are now all over social media. Small thing, big damage. Small input. Massive output. Let's look at the examples, though, from James. That's why they're in Scripture. They're there to help us. So James uses ships and and horses. And James may well have looked around and seen these Roman military horses or chariot races and observed how they can be manipulated by a small pull of the reins. If you don't know, I didn't really know. It's a piece of metal that goes in the horse's mouth. That's called the bit. One pull can change the direction of travel of the horse. Without the bit, the rider has no way of controlling the horse or the direction it wants to go. It's under the rider's control. A small object in the hands of a rider having a big outcome. The bit is effective. What about the ships that uh, that Rob put on the screen earlier? James may well have seen large ships coming in and out of some of those ports I've seen the rudder that controlled the direction of the vessel. I don't know if anyone uh, goes home on, on Sunday night after church. We've been looking at the, uh, the Royal Navy, the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier that's uh, going around at the minute. And it is enormous, ginormous, landing planes and all sorts. It's like a little village on sea. And yet, at the turn of a wheel, I don't know if even it's a wheel anymore, a flick of a button, that ship can be turned It's amazing that thing floats, let alone gets turned. You've probably seen container ships, these huge things that at the turn of a a wheel, the thing can change direction, albeit slowly, but that's that's what it can do. Well, nothing as big as a container ship in James' day, but the, the rudder is effective. So compare the tongue to a rudder or a ship or the bit in the mouth of a horse. It's a small part of your body... Yet it can do remarkable things by the person in charge. So let me ask you this morning, who's in charge of your tongue? It's a strange question, doesn't it? it you know, it's part of my body, it's, it's built into my, my throat and the anatomy I don't understand, but who's in charge of your tongue this morning? James says your heart is, and so does Jesus. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And James is saying, you want a barometer of where your spiritual life is this morning. James says a good place to start is by examining what's coming out of your mouth. Does it build up or does it tear down? Does it encourage or does it dishearten? When you speak, is there something inside you that says, I'm going to hurt this person. My mouths are going to be like arrows and they'll hurt, they'll cut to the heart. Does what you say one thing on a Sunday to your friends at church 
compare with what you say to your work colleagues on Monday? Do you join in with those coarse jokes that your non-Christian friends tell, or you notice someone who stands out for being different, for being pure, for being holy? And it all comes from the same source, our hearts. And what comes out of our mouth can be damaging, as we'll see in a minute. So the tongue is small, but effective. And as a sort of slight aside, Jesus in Mark's gospel is talking about falling into, into temptation. You could turn to it if you wish. It's Mark in chapter 9. So in the New Testament, Matthew, then Mark. You don't have to turn to it. I'm going to read the text. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, now that could be the children that were gathered round, or it could be on a more wider audience. It would be better for him to, for him, if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Listen now, verse 43 of Mark 9. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to... Then with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. What's Jesus saying here? But he's not really advocating sort of self-mutilation or anything. You know, getting a knife and hacking away at parts of your body. It's not... He's not really saying that, but what he is saying is find those areas in your life that are problematic to you. Is it a computer? Get a good filter. Is it the books you read? Don't buy them anymore. Is it the places you go? Don't go there. Turn off the TV. Don't buy those books. Don't listen to that music. Identify those things in your life that are wrong. There's a children's song, Be Careful Little Eyes What You See. Be careful, little hands, what you touch. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Mm. Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. So what James is not advocating here is, you know, you just cut our tongues off. No, no, that won't do any good at all. Why? Because the Christian religion is a, is a, is a, is a religion of words, of song, of praise. We pray to our Father who is in heaven. We sing to one another. We sing praise to God. We encourage one another. We build one another up. We sing hymns, psalms, spiritual songs. We love to do that. But keep a rein on your tongue. It's small, but it's effective. And of course, nothing of what James has said so far is, is negative. This, these verses 3 and 4... They're very positive, aren't they? Nothing is, is there. The bit in the horse, the rudder on a ship, small input, big output. If you're a scientist here this morning, that's a good thing, right? For little input getting massive output. This is good, and we want this. So there's nothing negative in what, Jesus, what James is saying yet. But we come on now to our second point, which is the tongue can be destructive. Verses 5 to 6 of James chapter 3. May I read them to you? So also, so he's changing now, dif- dif- different direction, just like the bit in the bridle and the, uh, and the rudder can change direction. So his, his uh, sort of narrative here changes. The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Verse 6, and the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The tongue can be destructive. I've been really helped by a book. I commend it to you. Uh, It's it's a new book. Uh, I was sort of preparing this and came across this guy, Jeff Robinson. It's from the Gospel Coalition. And uh, I read it in a couple of days, and it was extremely convicting. Uh, We don't have time to go through any of the subjects here this morning, but in it, he lists nine destructive categories about the way that we talk. Number one, gossip and slander. Rob mentioned it already, very unhelpfully, singled Amy out there, it was very cruel. Gossip and slander. 
I shouldn't really say this, but uh, you know, I've got some information I want to, uh, to tell you. Do you know what such and such has done? Do we use our tongues like that? Slander? Critical talk? Are oh, you no good? Sarcasm? Build me up and then tear you down. Boasting and flattery? Build me up and build you up. Lies and deceit. Angry, <coughs> excuse me, angry words, grumbling words, judgmental words, <coughs> cursing and taking God's name in vain. I've got seven, there's one more, so somewhere my maths has gone awry. Careless words, there's eight. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt me. And we know that's not true. Words are powerful. An inspiring speech can spark a great movement for political change with mis while misplaced words and miscommunication can have tragic consequences. So what do we, what do we use our words for? You don't know how many words the average person speaks in a day? I guess. Go on, shout out a number. A bit more? Yeah, it's between, it's between 10 and 20,000. Some people are more, <laughs> some people are less. And if you analysed all those words, would they be helpful, kind, a blessing to others, considerate, building others up, or would they be words that are hurtful, unkind, destructive, words that put others down, words of malice or gossip? We've been going through Genesis, haven't we, with, with, uh, with our pastor in the morning. One of the most destructive words, right at the beginning of Scripture, did God really say? And these words set in motion a devastating effect of the fall. You can trace through Scripture and see time and time and time again, words being used for destructive purposes. We then have the Tower of Babel, don't we, where God gives everyone different languages to speak. And this culminates in the story of salvation where Jesus is on trial and the crowds cheer and they shout, crucify him. Mm, destructive words. Cruel words. And they thought they were destroying Jesus. That's the end of him. But Jesus hangs on a cross and the words that now come out of his mouth they thought they were destroyed. He was destroyed. That's it. He cries out, it's finished. But they weren't destructive words. They weren't, a, they weren't an admission of defeat. They were victorious words. It's finished. What I came here to do has been done. It's been completed. And James here uses a, a very practical illustration of a forest fire. I've just completed in work a little online course about fire, the causes, the effects, how to put out a fire, where the meeting places are. Ask Ken if you're not sure about this building. He's our fire officer. How has a forest fire started? Well, in perhaps in dry weather, a devastating fire can be started by a discarded cigarette butt, a barbecue that hasn't been put out properly, a campfire that's got out of control, a small spark, a small flame, that causes massive devastation. You've seen the pictures, right? On, in, in the summer, you know, sending planes up to drop in piles of water. It consumes everything in its path. It's difficult to put out. The damage is lasting. Trees take a long time to grow back. If it's reached villages and towns, they're destroyed, everything in its path. And the, often the only way to put out a fire like that is to set fire to something so it's got nothing else to burn, nothing else to consume. Fight fire with fire. And can you see why James uses this example? Let's have a look. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. And what he's saying here is, it's a small spark. A small word. Out of place. One careless comment, one throwaway line, perhaps a well-meaning sentence said at the wrong time in the wrong context can do devastating long-term damage. And I wonder if you've ever said the words, oh, I wish I'd never said that. I wish I'd never said that. If only I could take those words back. We've all said it. 
But we blush, or we should do, because it's kind of close to the mark, it's personal. And James's words are supposed to create a response. It's very practical, isn't it? So let's make it practical to our lives. There are many more. What about the tongue at, at home? What words do we use to our children? Do we encourage them? Do we build them up? Or do we tear them down? We discipline. Of course we discipline. But when we discipline, do we show the gospel? And show God's grace in, in how he saved us? In those moments when we lose our temper, we're tired, we are lost our patience, we say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. You build up. You don't tear down. The tongue at work. Do we join in with the, the office grumbler? There's plenty of those in my work who hate the, the red tape. We're living in times of strike action, and there well, may, may well be a place for that. But do we glorify God in all we say and do in the office, in the classroom, in the care home? As Christians, we're not meant to be doormats. It's very right to make a stand against injustice, but if you're mistreated, how do we use our words to, to help in that? Do our colleagues look at us as those who'd be good in a verbal confrontation, a good verbal duel, because they will all, you'll always win? Or are you shining for Christ in those places? What about the tongue in church? So we've had the tongue at home, so very simple, very quick examples, the tongue in work, the tongue in church. Why on earth have I said that? Surely of all the places... Uh, we should be loving and building each other up and encouraging each other in church. But no, James felt he had to write this letter to, hit to, to, hit to this church, this group of people. And so we would do well to listen to it. It's sad. But the church is often the place where our destructive tongue can be at their most effective and their most active. I didn't enjoy that sermon today. I, I didn't find that illustration very helpful. The, term, the sermon was kind of a bit long. It's a bit short. <laughs> I, I didn't like that song. I, I didn't really like the tune. It was too fast. It was too slow. It was too modern. It was too old-fashioned. Destructive talk has no place. Feedback is welcome, but how you give it and when you give it is important. Don't tell the pastor on the door that his sermon wasn't very good. That's not a good idea. Nor really on that matter on a Monday morning when he will be attacked by Satan anyway because Satan is crafty he'll on Monday perhaps our own pastor when he's resting oh you should have said that well you didn't say that you could have said that differently you could have offended that person perhaps you should have said that do you see he doesn't want a member joining in but feedback is good and it's important what about in business meetings do you listen to other people's point of view are you quick to speak or quick to listen. You know, we're not robots, of course. Some people by nature are, are extroverts, some are introverts. Some people who can put a room and they'll talk to everyone. Others will be comfortable talking with one person, and that's okay. And we should also be able to take a joke. Don't be too serious. It's okay to laugh, even at yourself. But a couple of Bible principles before we come on to the last section. First of all, and I've, I've gone through Proverbs. Proverbs is very, very helpful in this regard. Proverbs 10, verse 19. When words are many, transgression is not lacking. But whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Well, that's helpful, isn't it? How many words are on average between 10 and 20,000? Some more, some less. When words are many, transgression, sin, is not lacking. Wow, that's God's word preaching and speaking to us. But whoever restrains, hold back, have a listen, is prudent, is wise. Do you talk and not listen? Do you always have the last word? A warning to those who don't show restraint. Proverbs 15, verse 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Do you know that? Ponder, thinking through how to answer. But the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. I think that's very helpful. The key word here being ponder. Before you open your mouth, do you consider what you're about to say? Are you about to cause hurt? That's something I'm trying to put into practice in, in my own life. Is only to speak after consideration, weighing up my words. Someone says this. We can spare ourselves and others a lot of pain by simply recognizing we don't have to verbalize everything we think. 
Be slow to speak your mind. And a word about social media while we're at it. This is a quote from the Gospel Coalition. Imagine if your next thought could potentially be heard by hundreds or even thousands of people and potentially shared so that it's known to millions. For most of human history, that ability was limited to only a handful of the most influential people on the planet. Yet today, because of communication tools like social media, our every utterance, whether silly or profound, wise or foolish, can be sent across the globe. Wow, that's challenging, isn't it? The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Such power, going back to that social media, should make us extremely cautious about what we say or write. Proverbs 29, verse 11. There's a lot of Proverbs here. I'd read it. A lot of wise stuff. A fool gives vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Rein it in. Proverbs 29, verse 20. Do you see a man who's hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. A warning to the talkative. A warning to those who don't show restraint. A warning to the liar. Proverbs 26, 28. A lying tongue hates its victims. A flattering mouth works ruin. Can your words be trusted? A warning to those who can't see other people's opinion. Are you a good listener? Or when someone's talking to you in your head, are you constructing your own response and not really listening at all? Proverbs 18, verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his opinion. Wow. Wow. Amazing challenge, isn't it? A fool. If, if you're a fool, if you're just standing there, when, when you're in a conversation, I've done it, you're not really listening because you want to try and think about what to say next. You're a fool. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his or her opinion. So, the tongue is effective, but the tongue can be destructive. And finally, the tongue cannot be tamed by man. This is verse 7 and 8 now of James chapter 3. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human, no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. And then we have this section about uh, salt water and fresh water and figs, very much like the passage we looked at in Luke as well. Once again, James uses illustrations, that, this time of an animal, or animals, and uh, mankind have always been interested in taming animals from a very small to a very great the majority of animals, and there's many animals that have not been tamed. I looked it up at Google. I think there's one or two that have not, not been successful in taming. On holiday last year, we went to, uh, to Portugal and we watched a dolphin show. You've probably seen them on telly. And they can do extraordinary things like kicking balls into hoops. And you know, the, the trainer is riding these dolphins. They've got a foot on each one and riding them around the pool. It was amazing. Really, really good. You, perhaps you've seen circus acts of elephants and tigers and all sorts of other animals doing wonderful things. Animals can be tamed, but we can't tame the tongue, James says. Taming animals requires discipline, hard work, weeks, months, years of training, often involves bribery. <laughs> you know, you tell a dog to sit and you get a biscuit. Walk to heel, to do stupid tricks, roll over, beg for food. Do this and I'll give you something, but the tongue can't be tamed. And that leaves us with a real big question. What, what therefore do we do? What hope are you giving us this morning from the, from the pulpit here? The, the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison. James is speaking about the heart. What's the answer? What's the remedy this morning? Because if you read the rest of the section, there is no hope from James. But it all comes back from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, the only way our hearts can be changed, sorry, the only way our tongues can be changed, what we say and what we speak, even how we listen, the tone of our voice, what we write on social media, is if our hearts are changed. And this is, is hard, isn't it? 
It was hard for the original recipients of this letter. It's hard for us. The tongue can't be tamed. So should we just be quiet? Should Christians adopt a sort of monastic living, you know, go to a monastery and never say a word to each other ever again? Of course not. Let me read you a, a kind of funny anecdote. Brother John entered the Monastery of Silence and the abbot informed him he was welcome to serve as a monk there but reminded him it was a silent monastery. You may only speak when I give you permission, he told John. After five years, Brother John was allowed to speak two words. He chose hard bed. (coughs) Well, I'm sorry to hear that. We'll give you a new one, the abbot said. Another five years passed before he was given permission to speak two words. Cold food. John received assurance the food would improve. On the 15th anniversary of entering the monastery, the abbot again granted him two more words. I quit, John said. To this, the abbot replied, it's probably best. You've done nothing but complain since you've got here. (laughs) It's a humorous story. We're not meant to be in a monastery. We're not meant to be monks who don't say anything with our tongues. We, as we said earlier, we're Christians. We enjoy talking. We enjoy building each other up. We enjoy singing praise to God. In fact, James says that. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, but also we curse people. We're sinners living in a fallen world. We'll never know this side of heaven, what it's like to have pure hearts and tongues that only speak praise and worship of Jesus and speak kindly to one another. But Jeff Robinson, again in his book, though the redeemed wrestle with indwelling sin, and we all do, and our talk is by no means perfect, still the Holy Spirit and not the serpent now rides the stallion in our mouths. Isn't that helpful? We all wrestle with indwelling sin. We'll all say things that we don't mean. We'll all have problems with the stuff that comes out of our mouth. And our talk is not perfect. But the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian here this morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives within you and is changing you. And that's who is in control of your heart. We looked looked at our introduction, we're poking our tongue out and saying, examine me, what's going on in our hearts this morning? The Holy Spirit rides within our hearts and not the stallion of the serpent, Satan. And when we have trusted Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes to live within us, changing us to be more like him. Our hearts have been changed. Our tongues will change. And it might not happen immediately. It might take many years. Remember listening to Gwydion's testimony on this. He had a terrible mouth, filthy mouth. He would tell you that himself. He became a Christian. Overnight, that stopped. That would not be the same for everyone. You might have a big problem with cursing and destructive talk, swearing, using the Lord's name in vain. You come to Christ, and why am I struggling with this? It might take you time. But over time, our hearts will be changed. Out of the abundance of our hearts, the mouth speaks, and our tongues will change. They have to. Why? Because he's put a new law in our hearts, a desire to serve one another, a desire to serve Jesus, a changed tongue to speak praise to him. What are the most wonderful words you can say? I was reading this in Acts the other day. When, we, we, when someone, I forget his name, was challenged about uh, becoming a Christian. What must I do? It was the jailer, wasn't it? What must I do to be saved? Oh, my friends, they're the words that most glorify God. What must I do to be saved? Tell me, what must I do to be saved? And then... Out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth will speak and will speak praise and glory to our God in heaven. We're going to close in a moment. I'm going to ask Ken to come up in a few moments' time. But I've chosen 823. It's a very old hymn, and it will be an old tune, so sorry for that. But just like we've been saying, let's not grumble about that. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy erring children lost Alone. Oh, lead me, oh, strengthen me, oh, teach me, oh, give me, oh, fill me. Oh, use me, Lord, use even me, just as thou will, and when and where, until thy blessed face I see. Thy rest, thy joy, thy glory share.
I'll ask Ken to come up and close and I'll just uh, play this last hymn for us. We're waiting for each other. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let's, let's sing this last hymn then. And uh, for those of us at a certain age, we don't mind the old tunes. Uh, Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. stay on and share fellowship with us and like a cup of tea or coffee then please come through the door here or through the door at the back and turn left and uh, we'll be delighted to get to know you better. Let's uh, commend ourselves to the Lord as we leave this service of worship. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>